Hello, welcome to the very first episode of OMFG Sarka. I'm Ash Sarka, your host, your spirit guide, your arch nemesis, or whatever. You can get in touch with me on Twitter, at IOCesar. You can use the hashtag, hashtag OMFG Sarka. I welcome comments, criticisms, denunciations, subtweets. If you've got a feeling, I want to hear about it. So this week, we have taken to the streets of London and we are going to ask these fine, upstanding citizens one very simple question. When were white people invented? When were white people invented? I have no idea. Uh... Probably like, like the 1930s. Have no idea. <laughs> I don't know. Probably not that long ago. I don't think. Um, who knows? But after the dinosaurs. Ever since the slave trade, maybe. I guess when um, the West or the white world discovered other continents where they saw people with darker skins. I guess with colonialism and an actual establishment of an us versus them. 600 AD. You know, I don't think it was ever invented. It's something that has been depending on where you've lived. And those who are most vocal are the ones who put their ideas out. And in the past, the most vocal and the most historical recording people in, in recent years has been the white populations. At first, like, there were humans like everywhere, but didn't know that there were other humans. And then maybe when they move, they start moving, they just being confronted to different people mm -hmm. and uh, like this is a main thing for humans being that being afraid of what is different. When I was in the minority situation in India, in Africa, in many different countries in Africa, I often thought why was it that I was born white in Europe when these people are born black in Africa and what's the difference? There is no difference really. It's a matter of where for some reason you're conceived and born and by what genetics uh, you have developed. What's interesting to me is that you're locating this in geography and genetics rather than history and culture. Do you think there's interaction between history and conceptions of genetics or are those things largely separate? Well, you know, if you, look at where, where, if you look at where history and, and, and the, the doctrines of the present era came from, they came from the European countries mainly because they were dominant in power, they were dominant in many different things, and in addition they were able to express themselves very clearly as to why they thought they were the chosen populations. And that occurred in many, many different instances. And other parts of the world many times just accepted this and went on about their business and their life without worrying too much about it. Today that is an entirely different issue become it's because it's become a very political issue. Do you think that's still a powerful deciding factor in how people think of themselves and how they relate to the world? I don't think um, so. I, well, no, no I, I don't. I disagree. I think um, I think a lot of people are um, you know struggle to actually break through in various different areas, like with job promotions and that type of thing. So I think regardless of whether or not they wanted to, it does influence their lives. I don't think it does, but I, I think about it from my point of view and I don't think it affects anything at all. I don't even think about it day to day, um, but I don't know if that's living in London, it's, you know, you've just got a variety of so many different people. It's still very important, yeah, because of sometimes the negativity towards certain races uh, makes people more conscious, more aware of their, their, their skin colour and their race. Do you think that the way people of colour think about race is different from the way people who would self-identify as white, self-identify as European, think about race? Do you think that people of colour think about it more often or less often? Or I think it's highlighted to um, people of colour more often and I find that we have especially been raised in a in a in a predominantly white country okay um you I, I have found that i have had to be more adaptable let's say and learn more um about my white counterparts than they probably would know about me okay so they will they will make they, they will still be surprised that as a black person i tan and I will say things like, if you put brown bread in the toaster, it gets browner. Okay, simple things like that. And I don't take offence to it, because I just think, if you don't know, you don't know. So it really is about educating them. But I would think that we think about it more so that we can fit in more 
or play the game. Play the game. One of the things that really struck me is that when we were talking about whiteness, there wasn't a sense of we were talking about the same thing at the same time. Some people went straight for culture, but rather than talking about whiteness as something tangible, framed it as a set of interactions they had with various racial others at different points in history, either in terms of living in Europe and dealing with migration from Africa, from Asia, from South America, or people talking about it in terms of white expansion. So what happens when white people came into contact with the other in Asia, in Africa, and in South America. What I thought was particularly revealing was some people wanting to establish whiteness as being outside of time, outside of history. It's something in the genes, it's something in the blood, or whiteness came along with the dawn of man. These are natural, non-cultural, non-historical phenomena. We're always used to thinking about how is the marginal identity constructed by systems of dominance and state apparatuses of racial domination. What we never question is when did these apparatuses and when did these systems first come into being? And if we find it difficult to find something tangible, maybe it's because whiteness as it is now is not something active or propositional, it is the blank space against which everything else is defined. If I were to ask myself this question, when were white people invented? I would probably cop out and say it was at multiple points in history. And what we see in terms of whiteness is not a unified blank, but actually a composite of different processes of racialization. For me, I would say this starts sometime in the 15th century when Pope Pius II realizes that Christendom is not enough to unite the powers of Europe against the Ottoman Turk. There has to be some conception of Europeanness. I would say the next decisive moment in thinking about race and the invention of whiteness is 1609 when the Spanish expel the Moriscos from Spain. The Moriscos were the descendants of the Moors who came from North Africa and they had all converted to Christianity. So as well as Morisco, they were called the New Christians. And there was this fear that despite their outward shows of engaging with what was thought of as European indigenous culture, that there was some treason in the blood that meant that they couldn't help but align themselves with the Islamic powers of the Ottoman Empire and also wanting to reconquer southern Spain and establish some kind of caliphate. So in 1609 they were all expelled by Philip II and I think that's one of the first moments where you see the idea of race as being a hereditary inheritance of culture. The next key moment would be 1619 with the first arrival of Africans at the plantations of Virginia. Now what's really interesting is that Theodore W. Allen says that while the first Africans arrived in 1619 there were no white people there and there wouldn't be for another 60 years because it took 60 years is for whiteness to be established as a legal category of identity. So when the Africans were first enslaved, they were actually working alongside indentured laborers from Europe who are mostly Scottish and Irish. And one of the problems was that Africans and these Europeans were starting to unite and revolt against their masters because they saw things in common which transcended the difference in skin color. Now in 1691, you have the first laws coming in differentiating between whites, regardless of their status as bonded laborers or freedmen, and Africans. And the primary difference was, even if you were a white bonded laborer, at some point you could work your way to freedom and you could not be enslaved indefinitely. Whereas for African laborers, you could be enslaved until you died and there was no way for you to work your way to freedom. After the bloodshed of the 20th century, two world wars, global anti-colonial movements, what have we got today? And I'd say we've got three really fertile areas of investigation. In terms of the future of whiteness, I think the first thing we really need to look at is this reinvigoration of a black freedom struggle in the United States. What we've seen in Ferguson, Baltimore and Charleston. And I think the reason we're going to see more and more of these kinds of struggles is because what we're witnessing is the breakup of the post-civil rights consensus where you have an idea that's accepted within society that racism affects black people and it requires a mass movement to try and tackle it. And what we're seeing now is this kind of zombie second life of the old guard of American racism, except now it's got this veneer of post-racial respectability. The second thing is, of course, Fortress Europe and the boundaries of Europe being redrawn, not, not simply in terms of migration across the Mediterranean, but with 
the potential breakup of the Eurozone and the EU. For instance, in Die Welt, it was argued that the Greeks are not really Greek at all, but a Turkish moulded mixture of Byzantines, Slavs and Albanians. And because they're not really European, they don't actually deserve more of our financial assistance. And I think the thing that we're going to see more of, and really this ties everything we've been talking about today together, is whiteness as a composite. So rather a single process of racialization against a single tangible racial other, we're going to realize that it's made up of lots of different processes of racialization. For me, the metaphor that I find useful for thinking about whiteness as a composite is Isaac Newton's 18th century experiments with light. And at the time, the scientific consensus that white was that white was the purest form of light. It wasn't made up of anything else. And through his use of prisms, he found out that actually it was a composite of every single color of the spectrum. That's the way I like to think of whiteness. It's a composite of every process of racialization that white people have imposed on their racial others. If you want to learn more about the origins of whiteness, this Friday on Navarro FM, I will be hosting a discussion looking at this very topic. We'll be looking at the 15th century to the early 18th century. Thank you so much for watching. I've been Ash Sarka. This has been OMFG Sarka. Bye.